Hello, my name is Jim Liversidge. I'm the curator of the Popular Culture Collections at the University of Florida. Welcome to a presentation from the Special Collections Department of the George A. Smathers Libraries at the University of Florida. The term popular culture was first coined in the 19th century to describe the uneducated, poor, mostly immigrant working class populace, along with their day-to-day -day activities at work, at home, and at play. This included their wardrobe, eating habits, and entertainments, which consisted of stories and songs from the old countries and the newer forms of stage, easily accessible and translated performance, including minstrelsy, the circus and vaudeville, as opposed to the high art and culture of the Broadway theater, opera stage, and classical music found in legitimate concert venues. The current usage of the term, although it was always used to describe and include burlesque, vaudeville, radio, popular crooners, and silent film stars, emerged in full flower following the Second World War and the growth of mass media, television, radio, recordings, and film, and the rise of the baby boom youth culture. The late Professor Ray Brown of Bowling Green State University in Ohio is considered the first academic to pioneer the study of this so-called frivolous and trivial subject matter. In 1973, he called it the people's culture. During the post-World War II period, popular culture merged and overlapped with mass culture, media culture, image culture, fashion, makeup, and hairstyles, consumer culture, and general mass consumption. Of course, throughout history, high culture often straddled popular culture. For example, the works of William Shakespeare, Charles Dickens, Leonard Bernstein, Stephen Sondheim and Arthur Miller, Laurence Olivier and Marlon Brando in their prime, Stanley Kubrick, Orson Welles and Alfred Hitchcock, Irving Berlin, George Gershwin and Cole Porter, and Meryl Streep and Robert De Niro at their best have always found an audience and appreciation across the social spectrum. Popular culture is a representation of the people. Their ideas, attitudes, images, and the everyday life of the average person, rich or poor, educated or uneducated, influenced by common perspectives and vantage points. The expanded scope of the scholarly and intellectual study of popular culture has had an increased impact on the holdings within the UF popular culture collections in the Department of Special and Area Studies. The Belknap Collection for the Performing Arts, which now includes over 250,000 individual items, was founded in the 1950s, originally as a dance archive, by Sarah Yancey Belknap, a UF librarian and respected dance historian. Her personal collection of scrapbooks, photos, programs, and miscellaneous ephemera provided the foundation for this area of collection that has grown to encompass impressive primary source research material for theater, film, music, and television. The Belknap Performing Arts Collection is represented here by the Theater Playbill and Program Collection, the largest in the Southeast, and by my all-time favorite pair of images from this far-reaching reserve of stage history. Here we have the toast of 1950s Broadway, Mary Martin, as she prepares to star in the original stage version of The Sound of Music. She is the center of attention as she is flanked by composer Richard Rogers, lyricist Oscar Hammerstein II, and the writing team of Howard Lindsay and Russell Krauss, responsible for the book of the show. It's evident that everyone is excited and thrilled that Mary has joined them on the sofa. Mary Martin appeared in the show from 1959 until 1961, when she was followed by the lovely and talented Florence Henderson of Brady Bunch fame. Florence was also welcomed with open arms by the creative production team. Or was she? Much like Mary Martin, Ms. Henderson excitedly donned her white party dress and rushed to the illustrious sofa. Or did she? If the souvenir book is any indication, Dick and Oscar, Howard and Russell, had little time for the also ran star of the show. It was decided that Florence's 1961 head would be cut and pasted to Mary's 1959 body. I guess Rogers and Hammerstein had moved on to Flower Drum Song and decided to wait out the film version of Sound of Music and Julie Andrews. But thankfully, somebody preserved these separate souvenir books, sold in theater lobbies for about a dollar a piece. And now, over 50 years later, we have the opportunity to view, contrast, and enjoy a hearty chuckle at Miss Henderson's expense. Oh, the indignities of show business.
The Susie Covey comic book collection, named for an esteemed Smathers Library colleague, includes 15,000 individual comic books and comic strips. Supporting the Comic Studies graduate program created by Professor Donald Alt in the UF English Department in 1988. The collection was formed by combining a small collection of vintage comic books from the Baldwin Children's Book Collection with large donations from private collections, including comic strips and comic books collected by Professor Alt and noted comic book historian Saul Davidson. Items have also been purchased, including one of only two known surviving copies of The Reign of the Superman a black and white, now yellowed publication, produced in 1933 by Superman creators Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster. This was a failed prototype featuring a hulking, evil Superman. The item, a mixture of hand-drawn pictures and manual typewriter text, was presented to publishers five years before the more successful offering of Siegel and Schuster's clean-cut, red, white, and blue-clad hero from Krypton that we've come to know and love for over 75 years. The Jim Liversidge collection represents 40 years of collecting as a hobby that grew into a cohesive assemblage spotlighting what was considered culturally important to the general public in the second half of the 20th century. Film, television, music, celebrity, politics, and day-to-day -day current events are presented in scrapbooks, photographs, posters, theatrical programs, souvenir books, letters, artifacts, and signed ephemera. The three individual collections mentioned stand alone as cultural documentation. But each collecting area also builds upon the other, and through budget and endowment purchases, donations, and an always searching eye, continues to grow each year. Should you search for film history in the Belknap collection, you'll also find supporting information within the Covey and Liversidge holdings. Another common factor connecting the three collections is the passion for collecting, demonstrated by Sarah Belknap, Don Alt, Saul Davidson, and myself. The joy was in the search. Exciting years of rummaging through vintage bookstores, flea markets, and websites in search of that one elusive item that would complete the task. When the collecting began, I never thought my hobby would one day be included in a major university collection. This to be kind eccentric hobby began in grammar school on a Tuesday. I can pinpoint this to November 26, 1963, following the assassination of President John Kennedy, when my third grade class was assigned the task of creating individual scrapbooks of newspaper clippings documenting the historic events of the previous tragic weekend. At that moment, I realized I truly enjoyed the business of preserving history between the faux leather covers of the 89 cent very acidic scrapbook purchased at W.T. Grant's department store. Around this time, I was also fascinated by the memories of my parents and their friends when they gathered together and discussed various subjects from their childhood and teen years. The events and personalities of the Great Depression were always referenced. But where, where were the buttons and the posters for the campaigns of FDR, Alf Landon, Wendell Wilkie from the 1930s? The Shirley Temple doll that was fondly recalled from those years. My mother visited the 1939 New York City World's Fair with her brother, my uncle, but we had no photos or souvenirs of the trip to the legendary fairgrounds in Flushing Meadows. The golden age of radio was always a happy memory for their age group. But where was the little orphan Annie Ovaltine mug they so often mentioned as they reminisced and sang the program's familiar theme? During the Second World War, my father served as a member of Patton's Third Army in the Battle of the Bulge. Before the epic battles of 1944 and 1945, he and his army buddies were treated to dinner by legendary stage, film, and radio star Jack Benny, who ran into them on the street in London while on a USO tour. But my father hardly ever spoke of his participation in the actual Battle of the Bulge, and he saved very little from his experiences in wartime Europe. My parents and so many of their friends were so busy experiencing this often tragic historical era of the Depression and World War II that there was little interest in time to reserve the tangible artifacts and ephemera. So much from the formative years of the greatest generation was produced to be used and discarded. What was saved and collected by a few is cherished today. Dick Tracy decoder rings, wartime ration books, comic books, 
Big Little Books, radio premiums, and movie posters. As a child lacking any popular culture artifacts and ephemera from the colorful days of yore I read about in history books, I decided I wanted to do my part to preserve the years that shaped my consciousness, the 1960s, the 1970s, and beyond. I began to save everything. If my parents took me to a play or a movie, I saved the programs, the ticket stubs, the newspaper reviews and advertisements. The influence of television is a major ingredient in the Liversidge collection, and some iconic items are included, such as this official Man From U.N.C.L.E. badge. It seemed every badge included in the toy attache case was number six for some reason. And here's a monkey's TV paperback. In 1969, on a seventh grade class trip, I retrieved an anti-war peace dove poster from a tree in the Boston Common, where a few weeks before the largest anti-war moratorium demonstration in the U.S. took place. Growing up in New Hampshire, I enjoyed access to the first in the nation presidential primaries from 1964 through 1988, saving all sorts of political memorabilia from the political onslaught. For six years in the 1980s, I worked in New Hampshire radio and television and had a front row seat to history, meeting, covering, and interviewing the likes of Ronald Reagan, Ted Kennedy, Jesse Jackson, Eugene McCarthy, George McGovern, John Glenn, George Bush, and Florida Governor Reuben Askew as they trudge through the snows to enter our plush, but not overly ostentatious studios. All of this material, such as my radio guest book, was collected, gently preserved, and squirreled away for decades, and is now included in the holdings of the Department of Special and Area Studies here at UF. The popular culture collections within the department are painstakingly processed and preserved, and it is incredibly gratifying to see the efforts of so many collectors used and appreciated by students and faculty on campus and researchers the world over. Through the years, the various collectors acquired material in specialized areas of interest. At the time, these hobbies may have been considered a nerdy pastime, and often the efforts were not readily appreciated. But by carefully storing the items, as well as they could afford, in closets, neatly stacked under beds or in attics and cellars, the collector patiently waited. He waited out the years until their collecting endeavors were discovered and appreciated. To this day, everywhere I go, I've trained myself to keep my eyes open for a brochure from an obscure amateur theater group, a newspaper insert that captures a moment in cultural history, a lobby poster handout in a movie theater, or a movie tie-in on a cornflake box, such as this King Kong Kellogg's promotion from 2005 or a promotional herald touting a celebration of popular culture at a local Barnes and Noble bookstore. Sarah Belknap and Ruth Baldwin did this, and all of our curators still do the same for each of their subject areas. This passion for collecting and preservation is demonstrated with each new collection added to our holdings. Most of the collection donors felt strongly enough about their materials to also save everything pertaining to their lives and careers or area of expertise but I've also discovered they usually are very surprised to discover the research value of their lifelong endeavors now housed in an academic setting. Preston Wood called himself a journeyman television scriptwriter, producing programming for most of the popular television classics of the 50s and 60s, Dragnet, Bonanza, The Addams Family, Quincy M.E., and many, many more. When former Smathers Library Associate Dean John Ingram and I met with Mr. Wood in Hollywood back in 1999, he wondered if anyone would be interested in his work. When I completed the processing of his papers and placed it online, we were contacted by his fans from around the world. Preston Wood was amazed and thrilled that his life's work was now acknowledged and studied by television researchers and historians. John David Ridge, the Tony-nominated Broadway and film costume designer, Amadeus, Dracula, Ring Round the Moon on Stage, and Seabiscuit, Men in Black, and the Tobey Maguire Spider-Man trilogy on film, told me he always laughed when he and his assistants packed each donation of his notes, sketches, programs, and photos to send to us. What would they do with this material? Well, his opinion dramatically changed when he presented classes to the UF theater students, and he witnessed the awe and wonder on their faces as they eagerly reviewed and gently handled the ephemera from his long career. 
Professors Ramon Figueroa and Efrain Baradas, respected lifetime collectors of art and themselves historians of popular culture, continually present materials to various library departments, including the amazing Efrain Baradas Mexican and Cuban film poster collection. Both gentlemen are great boosters of our daily work and their various donations demonstrate their trust in our abilities to preserve the rare art and posters we now retain. Bernard Parker, considered the go-to authority on the music of the war to end all wars, contacted me when he found his two volume history of the sheet music of World War I in the popular culture monograph research holdings. Dr. Parker wondered if we would be interested in his research collection of sheet music used to write the two volume set. Following an exhibit dedication of his sheet music in 2015, he expressed his gratitude for the efforts of the UF Department of Special Collections, as well as archivists and curators around the world who preserve the cultural legacy of our time. Another collection I had the pleasure to process was the Martin Harris Collection, the work of a professional photographer who worked for Stars and Stripes, Yank, Life, Look, and Collier, Collier's Magazines, and many other popular publications of the 20th century. He covered the Second World War and the post-war celebrity scene for over 50 years. Donated by his grandchildren, UF alumni, this collection of photos, slides, negatives has been added to the vast and varied accumulated holdings that form our department. I followed a very different path than many of my colleagues to the position of curator, but it is a dream job for a former collector who has always been dedicated to preserving the past. This zeal for collection, preserving and having the patience to wait until a forgotten historical moment or item is appreciated and sought after by those who recall the time or by those who are first introduced to a performer, a television show, a classic film, a patriotic song from the world wars, a political campaign or an historic event is a common thread that runs through the popular culture collection and all of the holdings in the University of Florida Department of Special and Area Studies collections.